Hello, CERN. My name is Hiranya. I'm a cosmologist, meaning that I study the origin, the evolution, and the fate of the universe. I'm part of the Planck collaboration. To understand the real value of that mission, we have to start by rewinding history. Cosmology is one of the oldest branches of science, but for the very longest time, we had no data with which to test our theories of the cosmos, and cosmology remained a speculative field. This situation has changed completely in the last couple of decades. We've realized that the universe is one big whodunit, littered with evidence and clues telling us what was behind the origin of the universe as we know it. And the biggest clue is the afterglow of the Big Bang. When you look even at the nearest stars, you see them as they were when they were younger. Because of the finite speed of light, when you look further out into the universe, the longer it takes light to reach you. So observing the distant universe is a kind of time travel. And the earliest light you can see comes to us from 13.8 billion years ago. This is how the sky would appear to microwave eyes. This is the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, the leftover heat of the Big Bang. We are bathed in this ancient light. When we look at this radiation, we see the universe as it was when it was only 380,000 years old. Now, 13 point billion years later, this light has redshifted into the microwave frequencies. The CMB is nearly uniform. Tiny variations in place to place in the temperature of the CMB reflect initial irregularities in the matter and radiation that developed into all the complex universe we see around us today. The early universe is a laboratory for testing physics at very high energies, about a trillion times higher than the energies reached by the Large Hadron Collider here at CERN. The origin of the universe is tied to this extreme physics and imprinted in these primordial ripples. Because we can never hope to recreate these extreme conditions in the lab, cosmologists are like detectives looking for clues in this ancient light for the physics that powered the Big Bang. The cosmic microwave background was discovered by accident by Arno Penzias and Wilson, who in Bell Labs in 1964 were using an experimental radio telescope to observe the radiation from between the stars. They stumbled on an unexpected hiss coming from all over the sky. In increasing consternation, they kept checking their electronics. And finally, in desperation, they even climbed into the telescope and scooped out pigeon droppings in the hope of getting rid of this noisy hiss. Then they talked to their colleagues at Princeton University and discovered that they had stumbled on the afterglow of the Big Bang, predicted since the 1940s, which the Princeton cosmologists had also been seeking. For their discovery of the first clue to the Big Bang, Penzias and Wilson also no won the Nobel Prize. In 1992, a NASA satellite called the Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE, took the temperature of the CMB, finding that it was just three degrees above absolute zero. That's very cold. But COBE did something much more important than just taking the temperature of the CMB. It discovered that the temperature in the early universe was slightly different from one place to another, and thus discovered the seeds of all the structure that we see in the universe from a galaxy to a human being. For this discovery, the Kobe detectives, represented by John Mather and George Smoot, also received the Nobel Prize. George is actually hosting the webcast of this event and fielding questions. The next chapter of the story begins with the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe, or WMAP, to its friends. Way out beyond the orbit of the moon, WMAP 
mapped the temperature fluctuations of the CMB with much higher precision and resolution than COBE. And with the help of this uh, new data, the baby picture of the universe came into sharp focus, and cosmologists were able to figure out the standard model of cosmology. As a PhD student, I was very lucky to be part of the WMAP team. Here's a picture of some of us looking very pleased with ourselves on the day that we got our first cosmological results with Dave Wilkinson, for whom WMAP was named. So how does the CMB give us clues about the universe? The early universe was very hot, and atoms were separated into their electrons and nuclei. Photons, or particles of light, couldn't get very far because they kept bouncing off these free electrons, and the universe was opaque to light. As the universe expanded, it cooled, and eventually, when it was about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, it wasn't hot enough to keep the atoms ionized anymore. And the electrons and nuclei recombined to make neutral atoms, and the universe became transparent. <coughs> Photons from this early time have been traveling freely to us ever since, carrying messages from the early universe. The majority of these photons have had very lonely journeys for more than 13 billion years, till they entered our detectors. So when we observe the patterns imprinted in this ancient light, what we are seeing is a cosmic tug of war, a battle between pressure and gravity that sets up sound waves in the early universe. So we see these sound waves frozen at the time that the universe became transparent. This map is a fingerprint that lets us rule out a large number of suspects. We dream up all sorts of possible universes, predict what their fingerprints should look like, and then figure out which of these possible universes are compatible with the actual one that we see. The three-megapixel baby picture taken by WMAP does not need a memory card to be recorded. In fact, the picture taken by this digital camera can be summarized in just six numbers that tell us the age, the shape, and the clumpiness of the universe, and its constituents, atoms, dark matter, and dark energy, and when the first stars formed. So with the help of this data, cosmologist detectives were able to weave together a history of the universe from the time that it became transparent. Matter is attracted to matter by gravity. And as chunks of matter start coming together, recognizable structures start to form. The universe is a dark place till the first stars turn on. Matter continues to evolve into filaments traced by clusters and galaxies. And we are looking back through all of this turbulent history to a much pristine ancient light. It's little wonder, when the universe is such a horrendously complicated place, that we like to look back to a time when things were just a little bit simpler. And that brings us to the present day. And Planck, a European Space Agency satellite mission that released its first cosmological results just a few weeks ago. As a third-generation CMB satellite, Planck is on a completely different level of complexity and ambition from previous CMB experiments, both in terms of the technology and the number of people involved. The success of Planck is a testament to European cooperation and the collaboration of scientists from all over the world, just like CERN, in fact. Planck's detectors can measure temperature differences of a millionth of a degree. That's like measuring from here on Earth the temperature of a rabbit sitting on the moon. In order to achieve this, Planck's detectors are cooled to just one-tenth of a degree above absolute zero, so that their own heat does not swamp the signal from the sky. That is colder than anything in nature. 
with the help of Planck's 50 megapixel map of the universe, the baby picture has come into yet sharper focus, and we've been able to measure the cosmological parameters to percent precision. Here's an example, Planck's measurement of the age of the universe, 13.82 plus or minus 0.05 billion years. That's half percent accuracy. With the help of the impressive quality of this data, we've been able to rewind the history of the universe back to just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. That's a decimal point followed by 32 zeros and a one. This brings us tantalizingly close to figuring out who'd done it. Where did all the stuff in the universe come from? At that time, up to a trillion times higher in energy than the LHC here at CERN, all the seeds of structure in the universe are thought to have been sown by the quantum fluctuations of a so-called scalar field, or the inflaton. In the same infinitesimal instant, the inflaton is thought to have made the universe grow by a factor of 10 to the power 26 in a process called inflation. The universe grew so fast that even light couldn't keep up, and space became flat and smooth throughout the observable patch. It's been a relief to us that the Higgs field was discovered here at CERN last year, because it's the first confirmed example of a fundamental scalar field in nature. So if nature can do it for the Higgs, then the basic ideas behind inflation start to seem more plausible. So inflation is a theory which has... Um, it is a big extrapolation of physics, of laboratory physics in particular. However, it has the virtue of making very precise predictions. For example, it says that the power in the CMB fluctuations should be distributed as a function of wavelength in a certain way. You can get an intuitive grasp of this by considering a graphic equalizer, like the one on your music player. So, if the universe had more power on small scales, compared to large scales, it'll sound like a treble-heavy piece of music, like this. And if it had more power on large scales compared to small scales, it'll sound like a bass-heavy piece of music, like this. And if it had roughly equal power on all scales, it'll sound like a balanced piece of music, like this. Thank you, Mr. Bach. <laughs> And so what inflation predicts is that there's slightly more power on the base side, then that's exactly what Planck has measured to very high precision. Inflation also predicts that the CMB hot and cold spots will have the statistical properties of a Gaussian distribution or bell curve. Planck has verified this prediction to one part in 10,000, and that's the most precise measurement we have in cosmology. Now, inflation wasn't the only theory for the origin of structure. Many other theories, based on different kinds of physics, did not pass the test of cosmological data. However, at this point, it's very important to remember something that's all too easy to forget. Looking and not finding is not the same as not looking. So, knowing what kind of physics is probably not going on in the early universe lets cosmologists, detectives, rule out certain theories from their inquiries. Planck also lets us look at a new type of clue. As the CMB photons travel towards us, their paths get very slightly bent by massive cosmological structures that they encounter 
on the way. These structures, the matter, mostly dark matter, act like a lens only powered by gravity, not glass, on the CMB photons. And that slightly distorts the pattern of the CMB light. Using this effect, we have been able to make the first full sky map of all the matter in the universe through 13 billion years of cosmic time. A new window on the universe has opened up. The coming year will bring yet another type of clue into play. In effect, the Planck satellite looks through a pair of polarized sunglasses. If inflation happened, the structure of space should be ringing with primordial gravitational waves, and these polarize the light of the CMB. Now, Planck has pointed the finger at inflation as the source of all the stuff in the universe, but if we could detect this polarization from the primordial gravitational waves, that would close the case beyond all reasonable doubt. We'll have a shot at this with the Planck polarization data coming just next year. Cosmologists are the detectives of science solving one of the grandest puzzles in all of history. Non-Gaussianity, lensing, and in a year's time, polarization. We'll have all of these at our fingertips. We are pushing back the boundaries of knowledge into territory previously only marked here with dragons. Thank you. <laughs>